William Blake used to say, uh, nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. And this seems literally to be true. It seems as though, you know, something once articulated, a statement, the reverberations are unto the last syllable of recorded time. Somehow it's all there. Now when I said these things approached and spoke in English, I didn't mean to make it sound as mundane as it might sound. You know, um, Greek religion was uh, characterized by what was called the logos in the Hellenistic period. And the logos was an informing voice. And all the great thinkers of, of Hellenistic times, Plato, Socrates, Xenophon, Thucydides, uh, all of these people were in contact with the logos. It was the sine qua non of Hellenistic religion. And it was a speaking and informing voice that tells you the right way to live. Well, we don't know what to make of this. Uh, and at a certain point in the evolution of the Western mind, judging by uh, the writings of people who were contemporaneous with those times, the Logos fell silent. There was actually a date. Uh, some of you may know the story of the fishermen pulling their nets off the Isle of Rhodes, uh, and they heard a voice from the sky say that Great Pan is dead. And this was at the change of the eon, the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Uh, it was almost as though there was something in the ancient world that has gone latent, that we can no longer touch or imagine. Um, Gordon Wasson, who discovered with his wife Valentina the mushrooms, told a very interesting story um, in one of his books about how in Mazatecan, uh, the, the people who are speakers of Mazatecan, when they chant what the mushroom says, uh, they have created a special form for this, which goes like this. Zabuz, 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 tz. This word tz means says. Zabuz, 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 says. Says. Uh, I didn't know this at the time I took mushrooms the second time. And in my head, I heard the mushroom speaking in English, but adding the word says to the end of the sentence. So it was almost like, you know, this thing could speak in Mazatec, it could speak in English, but it always kept its cadence and its structure. Um, the other thing about psilocybin and the DMT thing is that it, it um, seems to be a catalyst for glossolalia. This is why I think it must have had something to do with the evolution of language. I mean, when you take psilocybin, you can fall spontaneously into states of glossolalia. Sometimes on DMT, it's almost impossible to control. It just spontaneously comes out. Yeah. Oh, what is glossolalia? Glossolalia, well, here's an example of it, then I'll define it. It's, it's language-like activity in the absence of meaning. And it's a very interesting thing neurologically, because notice that... Uh, Speech, ordinary speech, is this highly variable stream of data. We are set up to make these small mouth noises. As a public speaker, I'm very aware of the fact that one can speak without tiring almost longer than you can do any other major human motor activity. And, uh, but the glossolalia, such as I just did, it is clearly under the control of rules, but it is not, there is no meaning conventionally conceived of there, but there is syntax. And I think probably that language was invented millennia before meaning, and that you could almost call 
glossal, uh, you could almost call language toneless singing. And that people used to sit around the campfire and amuse each other by making funny noises. As a kid, I used to do this. And then it was only much, much later that anything approaching linguistic conventionality was imposed on this and that that's a lower function. The other thing I want to say about this glossolalia thing is you may say, well, you're just making it up when I do that. But really, the experience I have when I do it is that I stand aside, then this variable data stream comes out through my mouth. Well, now, it has to reflect something about me. It's a statement about my internal situation in that moment. And it's evolving and changing as rapidly as if I were saying, you know, I had a migraine headache last night and I got up about four and took an aspirin and, uh, da -da -da -da. you know, I'm telling you about my situation. But the glossolalia must be speaking to something about my situation or it wouldn't be possible to do it at all. Not only is something not real unless it can be said, but the, the, count, the contrapositive of that is that once something can be said, it becomes almost too real. It displaces other possibilities. I mean, so we're living in a set of constructs, some architectural, some ideological, and uh, they can be very oppressive. I mean, how do you get rid of the notion of linear time and space uh, very easily? It's, it's the slow work of consensus. One of the things that I feel I'm doing very consciously in these kinds of meetings is we're trying to launch and replicate memes. You, you all know this concept? A meme is the smallest unit of an idea in the same way that a gene is the smallest unit of organism. And so these things, DMT elves, transcendental object at the end of history, so far, these are memes. And uh, in the same way that genes are copied and spread around and that fidelity of copying is the key to genetic su success, fidelity of, m of meme replication is the key to communication. I mean, if I give a speech on something and then you hear it and then you go out and somebody says, so what did he say? And you give a completely cockeyed account of what has been said, well, then the meme has been betrayed. But if you can actually transfer the meme to somebody else's mind and then they can copy it and pass it on, then the meme, uh, it's almost as though the ideological environment were like a rainforest. Uh, or a coral reef. Evolution is taking place. Stupid memes, dumb memes, have short lifetimes and they disappear, you know. Uh, and m memes of great power are able to thrive in many intellectual and ideological niches and to make many uh, marriages of convenience with other memes. And so they are stabilized and passed along. Somehow we have to become hip to the fact, to the power of language. And instead of just willy-nilly creating linguistic structures uh, sort of ad hoc, we need to begin to consciously engineer our uh, linguistic intent. And then, you know, so far in the 20th century, this has not been a program with a very happy history because only jerks have gotten a hold of it. Nazis and people with narrow social programs. They say, you know, we're not going to call each other Mr. and Mrs. or hey you. We're going to call, everybody's going to call each other comrade. And then this will create the notion of comradeship, which to a certain degree it does. But, you know, manipulating these things for political ends, I mean, the, you know, the Jews, it was okay to put Jews in ovens because the official language for talking about Jews was that they were untermensch, subhuman, not like us, whoever we are. So once the definition had been changed, people said, well, it's okay to mistreat Jews. You know, they're not even really people. And this, is, this kind of thinking goes on all the time. It's called stereotyping. And it always is an easier substitute 
it's a it's a cheap substitute for clear thinking. David Brown asked me the question, "What about life after death?" And I it was somewhat of a sidebar. Uh, the Buddhists at the folk level in India do say you cannot attain enlightenment unless your mother is dead, which is a kind of an odd notion, seeming to imply that she had to precede you into hyperspace. When you die, what you do is you literally, as appears to happen, you dissolve. And where you go is... Uh, forward and backward into time, not like a gas released into time, but along the tracks and trails of the genetic machinery. In other words, you flow into your children and you, you become, let, well, let's make a very simple model and say at the moment of death you become your children and your parents. A few moments later, you become your grandchildren and your grandparents. You're spreading down. It's almost as though the, the thing which you were, which was this focus of ego and individuality, then it dies, and it's almost as though the mountain begins to slump back into the generalized pool of consciousness and being. That's why I have somewhat less patience, maybe, than I should have with the idea of... of channeling and, and uh, come as you were parties and that sort of thing because it seems to me the key to understanding the idea of reincarnation and past lives is that you were everybody of course that's who you are here comes everybody you know you weren't just that shepherd girl or that Roman Empire emperor or that Greek you're everybody and you can find your way into the great genetic telephone system and ring anybody's bell in history. Well, then it would be absurd to claim you were that person. That would be as absurd as claiming that anybody you could call on the telephone is who you are. No, it's that we are everyone. And, you know, the great turning object in hyperspace that is the genetic, I don't know, uh, trans-dimensional object casts off glinting reflections of this personality, that personality. And astrology has a role to play here and other things. But the bottom line is uh, we are all drawn of the same stuff. I think one of the most profound insights you can have on psychedelics, and I certainly have it, is that uh, we are all interchangeable. You know, anybody could do my job and I'm pretty confident I could do almost anybody's job. We define ourselves otherwise, but uh, you know, in watching the in watching the rise of my own career, it's just it's a kind of being deputized, chosen for the job. It's just they said, "Well, him, he can do it. He has the gift of gab, so give him the credit line." But it could have been anybody. Our uniqueness. Is, uh, is real on one level, but on another level, it's fairly illusory. Uh, it's, it's sort of a coincidentia positorum. You have to hold these two antithetical things in your mind at once in order to correctly perceive uh, the proper level of ambiguity that's resident in reality. It ain't simple, folks. Yeah. Can I just ask this question? Do I understand you to say that to find our truer self, we have to go back to the worm-like stage and reach out for the pharmacological, the natural pharmacological that is in the Amazon Basin and all those plants and things to find our true inner being, ego, whatever. Well, I don't think we have to go back as far as the worm-like stage. I think what we have to do is uh, we have to get out of history. History is a con game run by frightened men and their obedient stooges. Uh, what, we had a moment of happiness. There was a moment of completion. I guess I should explain my position on this. You see, there have always been dominance hierarchies in primates. As far back as you go, clear back to squirrel monkeys, there are what are called male dominance hierarchies. Well, so then, uh, in us, this is, uh, has, was interrupted 
by psilocybin use over a period of probably a couple of hundred thousand years. The psilocybin, forget that it's psychedelic for a moment, just think of it as an inoculation against ego. And so for 200,000 years or so, it was a dietary item which suppressed this normal monkey behavior. And, and so then females were shared, the sexual style was orgiastic, uh, there were no awareness of lines of male paternity and the children belonged to the group. This was not quote unquote natural. The natural way is for the men to dominate, to control the females, to the old tooth and claw. But for a couple of hundred thousand years, it was artificially interrupted by the presence of mushroom in the Paleolithic human diet. Well then when, because of climatological factors and other factors that we can discuss in another meeting, the mushroom became unavailable, the old monkey behaviors reemerged only about 12,000 years ago. But in the previous 200,000 years, language had been discovered, fire, tool making, song, a whole bunch of uh, forward leaps had been made. Well then when the psilocybin was withdrawn and the patterns of male dominance reasserted themselves in an environment where fire and language had been achieved, it exacerbated it. It made it much more nightmarish. It made it much more difficult to step away from. And all of history is the unhappy story of our, essentially our withdrawal and our agony over being unable to reach this connection back into the Gaian mind, which when we had it, we lived in Eden. We were balanced, uh, but, but it faded and history was the consequence. Now in the last 50 years, information has arrived on our plate lo and behold, in the final ticking of the final hour of our dilemma that actually shows us the way back if we but have the wisdom to understand this and then the fortitude to apply what we know. One more question. Uh, to talk for a minute about motivation in relationship to psych psychoactive substances. You mean motivation to take psychedelics? To take action. To take action. Well, I think, you know, that, that this psychedelic community has not yet recognized or named itself as a community. We're well behind uh, gays and black people and all these other... Mi We're still trying to figure out if we are a community. And if we are a community and we have a domain of action, I think where it lies, it's not that we're all supposed to become dope dealers, it's that we're all supposed to become artists that the transformation of culture through art is the proper understanding of uh, what you can do with psychedelics besides blow your own mind. And I really think, you know, what we need to do is put the art pedal to the floor and understand that this is art. We are involved in some kind of enormous piece of performance art called Western civilization. And, you know, it's been a, a C minus performance so far. And they're just about to reach out with the hook and drag us off stage unless we begin pulling rabbits out of the hat pretty furiously. Art is poised for this, but art is ambivalent because the society is ambivalent. That's why meetings like this, where you actually hear it said, the sooner the better, the clock is ticking. This is not a test. There will not be a retry, you know. This is the window of opportunity between the unknown and eternity. If not taken, then the entire enterprise could be lost. The whole thing from the cave paintings at Lascaux to Whitney Houston, it could all go down the drain if we don't uh, you know, act to preserve it through an act of uh, human cognition plus courage.